My name is Leonita Inge, and I usually, as a journalist, deal in fact. I try to, and never hardly have time to read fiction, but in the past year or so, I found a book of fiction that held my attention. And the book is titled Winch by Dolan Perkins Valdez, and she's from Memphis, Tennessee. And to give you a little preface, um, this book is very interesting because it is based in fact, but um, um, if you search through history, it's hard to find the facts, so that's why she had to write it in this format. And it sort of tells you a little bit about the place um, where Wilberforce University is today, a historically black college in Wilberforce, Ohio. This was the second summer at the vacation resort for the six slaves. Three of the southern men brought their slave women with them, first on ships and then riding in separate train cars after they entered free territory and boarded the Little Miami Railroad in Cincinnati. None of the southern men brought their wives. Rini's master had brought his wife up close to the end of the previous summer, and Sweet's mistress was dead. Lizzie's master, Trail, had never mentioned the possibility of bringing his wife. It was no secret many of the northern whites who stayed at the resort disliked slavery. Even more, they disapproved of the slave women staying in the cottages with the white men. The resort was set in an area populated by Quakers and Methodists who declared themselves anti-slavery. West of Columbus, east of Dayton, 64 miles north of Cincinnati, the resort cast together an unlikely association of white southern planters, white northerners, free colors, and slaves. So the six slaves stuck together, close together, even avoiding the free black servants who worked in the hotel. Now there would be one more upsetting the easy balance of six. Lizzie guessed that Mawu was staying in a cottage like the rest of them. Surely Mawu's man wouldn't put her in the hot hotel attic with the rest of the servants and male slaves. She wanted Mawu to be in a cottage near hers. Even with Rini and Sweet, Lizzie sometimes got lonely at this place. Rini was always working, and Sweet was always tired. They all speculated on whether the woman was pregnant with twins, big as she was. The twin named George switched positions so that Rini could finish the other side of his head. I hear tell of this place nearby, colored folk, free and fancy folk. What you talking about, George? Philip faced him. I heard them talking. It's a place on the other side of them woods. It's where the free folk go to have summertime, just like this place, excepting it's for us and all you got to do is walk right through them there woods. Well, I ain't never heard of such, Lizzie said. Free colored folk having summertime. Mamu edged so close, Lizzie could smell her. Well, miss, what you say your name was, Lizzie? Miss Lizzie, you must not even been off your place before. It's plenty of us free colored folk, rich too. And this is from the book Wench by Dolan Perkins Valdez.
everyone doing? Yeah. All right. My name is Matthew Taylor, and I'm a first year student, uh, double majoring in political science and African American studies. I'm pro black, I do poetry, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> So I hope you like this original piece I wrote back in high school called Afrocentric Motion. <clears throat> from the East Coast, yet my ancestors wrecked the West as I breathe from my melanin chest. NC race, but I'm African. I stacked against me, but I'm destined to win. Heart of a warrior, this jungle of the world is my element. Straws break camels with backs. I set a precedent of a will that will never bend. By the weight of the work, it'll sooner end. Since Amistad, we've held birth of a nation. The thankless caretakers of our country's forefathers bore the bastard of racism till finding peace, a later daughter. So in a world of mad men, we form spirit brothers, trying to hear freedom song. Shout out to Danny Glover. For who dubbed the bell toll? Not sure, time to move. If we're not living already, then what's it like to lose? So all respect to Martin and the Mars and those who refused existence previously offered. They made strides in which we could follow and passed the torch to us to keep the brightness of tomorrow. For our journey's still going like the pattern of a drum, sticking to our values like our souls were holding gun. And in our past the rhythm, the people instinctively travel, like a tribe on a quest to the Tower of Babel. So we all can get high. Let the sky hold our limits. Looking up to God with his graces will finish. Moving on up, that's the song that I'll cry, to this era that I'm making entitled Good Times. Thank you. <laughs> some notes on barriers to women and loving, and I'm only going to read uh, a portion of it. Racism. The belief in the inherent superiority of one race over another, and thereby the right to dominance. Sexism. The belief in the inherent superiority of one sex, and thereby the right to dominance. Heterosexism. The belief in the inherent superiority of one pattern of loving, and thereby its right to dominance. Homophobia the fear of feelings of love for members of one's own <coughs> sex, and therefore the hatred of those feelings in others. The above forms of human blindness stem from the same root, an inability to recognize the notion of difference as a dynamic human force, one which is enriching rather than threatening to the divine self, when there are shared goals. To a large degree, at least verbally, the black community has moved beyond the two steps behind her man, concept of sexual relations, sometimes mouthed as desirable during the 60s. This was the time when the myth of black matriarchy as a social disease was being presented by racist forces to redirect our attentions away from the real sources of black oppression. For black women as well as black men, it is axiomatic that if we do not define ourselves for ourselves, we will be defined by others for their use and to our detriment. The development of the self-defined black woman, ready to explore and pursue our power and interests within our communities, it is vital component to the war for black liberation. The image of the Angolan woman with a baby in one arm and a gun in the other is neither romantic nor fanciful. When black women in this country come together to examine our, our sources of strength and support and to recognize our common social, cultural, emotional, and political interests, it is the development of which can only con contribute to the power of black community as a whole. It can certainly never diminish it, for it is through the coming together of self-actualized individuals, female and male, that any real advances can be made. 
The old sexual power relationships based on the dominant subordinate model between unequals has not served us as a people, nor as individuals. Black women who define ourselves and our goals beyond the sphere of sexual relationship can bring, bring to any endeavor the realized focus of completed and therefore empowered individuals. Black women and black men who recognize that the development of their particular strengths and interests does not diminish the other do not need to diffuse their energies fighting to control over each other, for control over each other. We can focus our attentions against the real economic, political, and social forces at the heart of society, which are ripping us and our children and our worlds, our worlds apart. As black women, we have the right and responsibility to define ourselves and to seek our allies in common cause with black men against racism and with each other, white women against sexism. But most of all, as black women, we have the right and responsibility to recognize each other without fear and to love those we choose. Both lesbian and heterosexual black women today share a history of bonding and strength to which our sexual identities are our differences must, and our, our other differences must not blind us. Simone de Beauvoir once said, <clears throat> it is in the knowledge of the genuine condi conditions of our lives that we must draw our strength <clears throat> excuse me, to live and reasons for acting. Racism and homophobia are real conditions of all our lives in this place and time. I urge each one of us here to, to reach down and that, in that deep place of knowledge inside herself and touch that terror and loathing of any difference that, lie, that lives there. See whose face it wears. Then the personal as the political can begin to illuminate all of our choices. From Sister Rosalders. again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings could knive nor tyrant's scheme, that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wealth, wreath, I'm sorry, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog-eat-dog, -dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the goal, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to 
the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean. Hungry yet today despite the dream. Beaten yet today, old pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead. The poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream. In the old world while still a serf of kings who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings. In every brick and stone, in every furrow turn, that's made America the land it's become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy tea lee and torn from black Africa's strand I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today. The millions shot down when we strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay, and all the dreams we've dreamed, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be the land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, who, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, Call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem. The land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Let America be America again by Langston Hughes.
Translating this to the larger world, I was being taught to buy and to use my body from the neck down, while the white upper class boy was being taught very early to prepare himself to build things and run things using the neck up. Two different worlds. My world, depending on and working for others, and his world, controlling his own destiny. Good evening, everyone. My name is Washi Downing. <coughs> so glad to be here today. I'm a junior public policy major and minor in social economic justice. I'll be reading two short poems. The first poem is by Paul Lawrence Dunbar entitled We Wear the Mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides, and, it hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be? over wise and counting our tears and sighs. Nay, let them see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh, great Christ, our cries, to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but O oh, the clay is bowed beneath our feet and long the mouth. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. The second poem is a short poem by Langston Hughes entitled, I Continue to Dream. I take my dreams and make of them a bronze vase and a round fountain with a beautiful statue in its center and a song with a broken heart and I ask you, do you understand my dreams? Sometimes you say you do and sometimes you say you do not. Either way, it does not matter. I continue to dream. Thank you. Because you won the American visa lottery to confess their indie. 
Your parents who often held hands as they walked to church on Sunday mornings. Your father who brought back his old boss's old newspapers from work and made your brothers read them. Your mother whose salary was barely enough to pay your brother's school fees. At the secondary school where teachers get an A when someone slipped them a brown envelope. In later weeks though, you wanted to write because you had stories to tell. You wanted to write about the surprising openness in America, the kinds of things that one should hide or should reveal only to the family members who wish them well. You wanted to write about the way people left so much food on their plates and crumpled a few dollar bills down as though it was an offering, expiation for the wasted food. You wanted to write about the child who started to cry and pull out her blonde hair and push the menus off the table and instead of the parents making her shut up, they pleaded with her, a child of perhaps five years old. And then they all got up and left. You wanted to write about the rich people who wore shabby clothes and tattered sneakers who looked like the night watchmen in front of the large compounds in Legos. You wanted to write that rich Americans were thin and poor Americans were fat and that many did not have a big house and car. It wasn't just to your parents you wanted to write. It was also to your friends and cousins and aunts and uncles. But you can never afford enough perfumes and clothes and handbags and shoes to go around and still pay your rent on what you earned at the waitressing job. So you wrote nobody. Nobody knew where you were because you told no one. Sometimes you, let, you felt invisible and tried to walk through your room wall into the hallway. And when you bumped into the wall, it left bruises on your arms. Once Juan asked if you had a man that hit you, because he would take care of him, and you laughed a mysterious laugh. At night, something would wrap itself around your neck, something that very nearly choked you before you fell asleep. I wrote the short story, The Thing Around Your Neck, by Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie. Thank you. Sit there and listen. 
I listen to the rhythmic patterns of your breathing as it echoes through the phone. And ironically, it hits me right where I'm the weakest, my heart. That feeling of flying without wings, of falling without being scared, yeah, I'm there. I can just sit and listen to you all day until the end of time. Just let me stare into those beautiful eyes and never say a word. Who can forget that eight hour conversation in the park on our, very, on our second date? Or those random questions on the phone when I say, hey baby, guess what? I love you. MJ, Lexi, two hearts, one beat, two people, a love so deep. See, it's all these types of loves, it's all these types of feelings that I live for. I hate even using the word love to just begin to describe my affinity for you because I feel like you deserve so much more. J. Cole said it best when he said, I can't get enough, can't get enough of what you got. Little girl, you definitely hit the spot. On the left side of my heart, on the left side of my body, right behind my rib cage. I'm not saying that we're gonna get married 10 years from now. I can't even promise a relationship 10 days from now. But all I know is when I say those eight letters, those three words, there's only one meaning. When I tell you I love you, Catherine, I, I don't say it out of habit or simply make a conversation. I say it to remind you that you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Two hearts, one beat, two people, a love so deep. Eight, three, one. Humphrey, 
the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be right back after a, after a brief message, after a white tornado, white lightning, or even white people. You will not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, the tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with coke. The revolution will not fight germs that may cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised. Will not be televised. Not be televised. The revolution will be no rerun, brother. The revolution will be live. Thank you.
we only have a few more readers, but then we'll have an opportunity to experience the cuisine. That's one of the main reasons why half of us are here tonight, right? <laughs> okay, well, we've got three more to go. But first, I want to know when I love my hair, and I want someone to tell me when I love my hair. And I'm going to bring forth Shaughnessy to tell us a little bit more about that topic. So 
I'll read one more piece. This is from the other cousin's perspective. So there's uh, these two cousins, like I mentioned, whose story we sort of see pretty pro prominently throughout the piece. One is light skin, one is dark skin. So as you can imagine, it sort of shows up those dynamics throughout the piece. Um, and I forgot to say that this is mostly interview based. I've been conducting interviews with women um, for the past about three years. This character is named Genevieve. And this is uh, a moment where she has um, gone to a sixth grade pool party with the mostly white girls in her class. Here I am with my thick thighs and round booty. I wear my hair loose, let my spiraled curls from the beauty salon loosen and fall until it seems that I too have something worthy, tousled, free, acceptable, fine even. I know this performance is a lie when I attend Sarah James's pool party where the white girls surround me. As soon as my head dips underwater, my hair shoots wildly from my head. In a pool where each girl's hair is undulate across her face like the waver of some intense, intense heat, my hair has become native, kinky. In the words of intolerable anthropologists, my hair has gone native. And I'm ashamed embarrassed. I keep my hair under the water as much as I can stand, the weight of the water keeping my hair heavy, too heavy for it to spring up. Genevieve's mother comes to pick her up and she runs to the car. Aunt Sandra says, what happened to your hair, Genevieve? I got my hair wet in the pool. What happened to your swim cap, Genevieve? Mom, none of the other girls were wearing a swim cap, so I didn't want to wear no stinking swim cap. Don't sass me, young lady. Now, I'm specifically, I specifically instructed you to wear your swim cap and keep your narrow behind in the shallow wind so you wouldn't get your hair wet. You mean to tell me you've been running around with those white folks with your hair looking like that, Genevieve? You got to do better. I don't have many memories of Mama doing my hair when I was younger. But I remember this one time when she complimented me on my hair as if I'd finally done something right. And I believed it. I believed in the softness she said it had and that I'd done good. Sometimes she'd scratch my scalp so exquisitely with the tail of that comb, my chest would flame. Mama likes to pretend that I have a braid of hair that I don't really have. So instead of letting me get a relaxer like my cousin Moni, I still get pressing curls. The white in her drives her to do stupid things like brush my freshly pressed hair twice a day, trying to make it straighter like hers. Mama has granddaddy jeans, soft, wavy, manageable, good hair. Granddaddy Raymond kind of looks like a white man. I don't know what he's mixed up with, but his good hair and hazel eyes made life hard for Grandma. She always used to say that she used to have to beat them heifers off. Mama has tried the most creative solutions to make my hair good. Rinsing it with beer, conditioning it with mayonnaise, lightening it with lemon juice, oh, and olive oil to smooth it all out. When I was seven, I went to sleepaway camp for children of not so dark black parents, loads of doctors and lawyers. I learned that my hair gave me a pass that my not quite fair enough skin could give me, at least in that crowd. I just barely passed the brown paper bag test. Yes, I was actually tested. They let me stay because of my hair. Since that day, Mama has put all her energy into vigilantly protecting my good grade of hair. After all, I passed the test. My good hair, the great redeemer. Thank you. everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here and I thank the uh, CBC for organizing this. If we don't tell our own story, either there'll be no story or be a pack of lies. <laughs> well, speaking of stories, we often don't hear the voice of, of uh, the slave. And my husband sent me an article, um, a reprint of a letter written by a Jordan 
Alex Anderson, excuse me. Um, and he wrote this from Dayton, Ohio, August 7th, 1865. And I'd like to read this letter to you. I think of the time and the place. To my old master, Colonel P.H. Anderson, Big Spring, Tennessee. Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you had not forgotten Jordan and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better for me than anybody else can. <laughs> I have also often felt uneasy about you. I thought the Yankees would have hung you long before this for harboring rebs they found at your house. I suppose they never heard about your going to Colonel Martin's to kill the Union soldier that was left by his company in their stable. Although you shot at me twice before I left you, I did not want to hear of your being hurt and am glad you are still living. It would do me good to go back to the dear old home again and see Miss Mary and Miss Martha and Alan, Esther, Green, and Lee. Give my love to them all and tell them I hope we will meet in the better world, if not in this. I would have come back to see you all when I was working in the Nashville hospital, but one of the neighbors told me that Henry intended to shoot me if, I, if he ever got a chance. I want you to know particularly that the good chance is, what, what the, I, I, know, I want to know particularly what the good chances you propose to give me. I'm doing tolerably well here. I get $25 a month with victuals and clothing, have a comfortable home for Mandy, the folks call her Mrs. Anderson, and the children, Millie, Jane, and Grundy. They all go to school and are learning well. The teacher says Grundy has a head for preaching. They go to Sunday school and Mandy and me attend church regularly. We are kindly treated. Sometimes we overhear others saying, them colored people were slaves down in Tennessee. The children feel hurt when they hear such remarks, but I tell them it was no disgrace in Tennessee to belong to Colonel Anderson. Many darkies would have been proud, as I used to be, to call you NASA. Now if you will write and say what wages you will give me, I will be better able to decide if it would be to my advantage to move back again. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there's nothing to be gained on that score. As I get all my free papers, I got all my free papers in 1864 from the Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville. Mandy says she would be afraid to go back without some proof that you were disposed to treat us justly and kindly. And we have concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. <laughs> this will make us forget and forgive old scores and rely on your justice and friendship in the future. I served you faithfully for 32 years and Mandy 20 years. Now at $25 a month for me, and two dollars a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to hmm, eleven thousand six hundred and eighty dollars. Add to this the interest for the time our wages have been kept back, and deduct what you pay for our clothing, and three doctor's visits to me, and pulling a tooth for Mandy, and the balance will show what we are entitled to. Please send the money to Adams Express in care of B. Winters Esquire, Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> if you fail to pay us for faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith in your promises in the future. We trust the good maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers. 
in making us toil for you for generations without recompense. Here, I draw my wages every Saturday night. But in Tennessee, there was never any payday for the Negroes, <laughs> any more than for the horses and the cows. Surely there will be a day of reckoning for those who defraud the labor of his hire. In answering this letter, please state if there would be any safety for my Millie and Jane, who are now grown up and both good looking girls. You know how it was with poor Matilda and Catherine. I would rather stay here and starve and die, if it came to that, than have my girls brought to shame by the violence and wickedness of their young masters. You will also please state if there has been any schools open for the colored children in your neighborhood. The great desire of my life now is to give my children an education and have them form virtuous habits. Well, say howdy to George Carter and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you were shooting at me. <laughs> from your old servant, Jordan Anderson. Thank you. Mandy, 
Make a job keep still. Don't you hear the echoes calling from the valley to the hills? Let me listen. I can hear it through the brush of angels' wings, soft and sweet. Swing low, sweet chariot, as Melindy sings Paul Arnstein. I was born on the side of a mountain, next to a running stream, alongside a cornfield, under a breadfruit tree and stars. Mama bathed me in Black River. Great Mama shined me like <coughs> brass pots, coconut oil and shea butter. Baba gave me cloth and cowrie shells. Great Baba bring honey wine and calabasas. Village women sing my praises, drum sounds, dance around trees, footsteps of ancestors praising my birth. I was raised with a bucket on my head. I sell mango in Jamaica, wash clothes on the banks of Nyanza, tote water down Carolina Way. On my first blood, I wear white. Dance with the women of Boa Morte under the full moon. Great mama oiled me crown and womb, sandalwood and myrrh. Wash my feet in Florida water. Mama weave the head wraps, silk and gold. Baba, there is any man to touch. When I was young, with skin firm as fresh plantain, I slept and ate on banana leaves. Became a woman. Pounded yam, white clothes, and sheets on the line. Smooth play floor. Great mom pulled my plaits. If I did not learn, this is how you keep a man. With eyes and hips, look at him like he yours. Walk so he stands still on a country road and watch you till the sun go down. My hips were wide as a board when I left home, cardboard suitcase. Bundle upon my head, walked a dusty road, washed my feet with the rag, put on travel shoes before I board the bus, paid 10 cod for the boat, tied my bundle across the donkey and walked the borough. The elders wept and pointed, said, do not go into that strange land. They don't cook like us. They are not clean. They follow the white man. They are savages and they live in trees. Their women are loose. Their men are animals. Their children run wild. They will mash you up. They will rob you. They will kill you. I went anyway. Got there and found out they was me. Listen, listen, close your eyes and listen. In Kingston and Soweto and Bahia and Detroit and Port-au-Prince and Dar es Salaam, they're boiling yams and oiling scallops, cooking for the church, scalding with grandchildren, birthing babies, making cornbread and frying fish, humming and stitching and repairing the thread, dancing in the villages. They have survived the whip, the hunger, the war. They have survived. You have survived. Listen. Listen. The sound of the world is the same all the performers. We are lucky tonight because we've had an opportunity to share a reading with each other. But now it's time to eat, but before we do that, I'd like to bring our favorite singer to the stage so she can lead us in a song. Lift every voice. If you look at the back of your pamphlet, you will have that. And I can't sing, but you'll probably be glad I don't need it. So she's lead us. Yeah. <laughs> 
See you.